Yeah, things I've been thinking about for the last couple of days uh, in terms of Ole Miss and Omaha and things like that. So let's start with this. And I'm not talking about a dumb and dumber, you mean like one out of a hundred? No, one out of a million, so you're telling me there's a chance, or just any given Sunday kind of chance. I mean, do you think, honestly, that Ole Miss is equipped to win the national championship? Do they have a team that is equipped to do it beyond just the, well, they're in it, so obviously they have a chance? Do you think this team is equipped to do it? Um, I got hung up on your any given Sunday reference. <laughs> it's about inches. Um, yeah, I, I, I do. And... I think there are two or three reasons why. First and foremost, they're playing hot. They're they're hot with a ton of confidence right now. And usually a team that is really – now, I I understand the – well, if you got to Omaha, you're hot. To a certain degree, yes. I mean, you had to win a regional and you had to win a super regional. But there are a lot of national champions you can point to. You're like, "Mm, where'd that come from? And they just ride the wave of momentum. Ole Miss has got that wave of momentum. How long they'll be able to ride it? I don't know. That's number one. Number two, if you get dominant starting pitching, you've got a chance. Now, again, how long can you ride that wave? Because really it's only two starts of complete dominance for both DeLucia and Elliott. So you go back to the, the, the A&M weekend, and Ole Miss only won one game. And against LSU, you know, some higher scoring games. And DeLucia was magnificent against, L, against LSU. But it's the last two weeks, right? It's, it, it's Dylan DeLucia against Arizona. And honestly, he gave up four runs that night. And then last week against Southern Miss, and it's Hunter Elliott against Miami, avoiding the mess and the traffic on the bases, and then this past week where he was just absolutely dominant. So you're asking for a third consecutive start and a fourth consecutive start from both of those guys to try and make happen what you're asking about. And that's a big ask. But somebody's going to win the thing. And, and if you look at Ole Miss's side of the bracket, Borky, your bigger question about can they win the whole thing, I think comes down to this. Do you think they can beat Auburn on Saturday? Yes. And if they beat Auburn on Saturday, do you think Hunter Elliott can take the mound on Monday night and beat either Arkansas or Stanford? Not will they, do you think they can? Yes. And if the answer to those two questions is yes, then they got a great chance to play for a national title. Now, once you play for a national title, I got no idea how it shakes out, right? Do they win the whole thing? Do you win two out of three? But if you go 2-0 and oh in bracket play, I mean, you, you now just have to win a third game which means you're better suited pitching-wise because to get to the point where somebody else has to beat you, they're going to have to play two more games. And they got to beat you twice. So if you believe that Ole Miss can beat Auburn and or Arkansas slash Stanford, then the answer to your question of do you think Ole Miss can win it all legitimately? Yeah. Now, does Auburn look at it and say, Is there a scenario where we can beat Ole Miss and or Arkansas or Stanford? Yeah, they do. Does Arkansas look at it where they go, can we beat Stanford and then can we beat Ole Miss or Auburn? Yeah. And Stanford, like all four teams on the right side of the bracket, and frankly all four teams on the left side of the bracket, I think do and should feel that they're capable of doing that. Somebody's going to go 2-0, though, on both sides. 
And those two teams have an overwhelming advantage over everybody else. Fair enough. All right. At the end of the day, Ole Miss is playing great baseball right now. They're playing with a lot of confidence. They can throw out two solid starting pitchers in these first two games. If they stay in the winner's bracket, they have a great chance. They go to the loser's bracket, I, I don't see them coming out of that. But if they can start off 2-0, and oh, yeah, for sure the way they're playing right now, they can definitely go all the way. Yeah. Question number two. Okay. What stops them from getting there? Is there a particular glaring weakness when you look at them that thinks, you know, that if they don't get there, that's probably why? Running into somebody that has – that, that has a performance like what Hunter Elliott or Dylan DeLucia gave Ole Miss last weekend. R- running into a guy whose slider is just on fire, got some run and life on the fastball, and he's mixing in the changeup. And, you know, is that, is that Arkansas's number two? Is that one of Stanford's guys? Is that Mason Barnett from Auburn in game one? I don't think Auburn has a pitcher before you get to Blake Burkhalter at the end of the game that has that kind of stuff. I think you're going to score some runs against Auburn. And then do you hold their offense down enough? I honestly probably don't know enough about Stanford to really qualify there. But to me, that's what would stop them. They just run into an arm. Yeah. And statistically. what what, What stopped Texas last year? Texas was good enough to win that whole thing last year. Will Bednar stopped Texas last year. 15 strikeouts. And horns down. And horns down. Didn't get penalized for it, by the way. Good for him. What's he going to do? Get a 15-yard unsportsmanlike? (laughs) The the numbers say that... In baseball, you can do hand gestures, and it's not a problem. Well, all of them. Even the actually offensive ones. Anyway. Yes, um, exactly. (laughs) just, Just two over. Um, it, just one over. Oh, I, I'm stupid. Um, is it fair to say that I think that, and this is true for a lot of teams, but like Stanford's numbers statistically on the mound, they're pretty phenomenal. Um, that if Ole Miss getting to game three in the the first regional setting is still a question mark because you don't know if if they had to play three in Hattiesburg, who was going to throw. Uh, Mike Bianco left the TBA there, wasn't necessarily going to give it to Derek Diamond, and uh, lately he's been kind of getting squared up. Now, Mm -hmm. maybe the big ballpark helps him, but it's so big that when you're getting squared up, if it doesn't go over the fence, it still goes in the gap. So what's the difference? Uh, And coming out of a loser's bracket, if they happen to lose and they have to come out of a loser's bracket, I feel like they are less equipped than maybe some of the other teams in Omaha to come out of that because who do they throw in game three? You know, is it Diamond? And then if it's not Diamond, is it who? Is it John Gaddis, who you haven't used in a while and just served a suspension so he didn't piss, pitch last weekend or the weekend before? Where do you go in game three is more of a question for Ole Miss than a Stanford, for example. Did Gaddis pitch against – he pitched against Arizona in the final game of the Miami Regional, didn't he? I stopped paying close attention once, like, the <laughs> 17th run was scored, so I'll go back and look. It's fair. Hey, is there, what, what do you see slowing Ole Miss down? That, we, that they somehow revert back to mid-March through late April Ole Miss, that they're just riding a high and, and then they come down from it. That, that was, that's what would worry me. We've seen them play poorly a lot this year. You know, they, they they don't need anything that bursts their bubble. They don't need they don't they need to keep riding high. Yeah, just did pitch ocean. two innings in that game for what it's yeah. worth. So he did actually pitch after his suspension. Debbie and Ocean Spring says, I think Ole Miss might be peaking. Hey Dad, what do you think? Oh, I mean yeah. <laughs> they yeah, they won five straight postseason games. Yes. Absolutely. You've been pondering about the College World Series and Ole Miss's chances in it. Yeah, the next one 
So obviously, well, it's not TD Ameritrade anymore, whatever it is Charles now. Schwab Field. Charles Schwab Field. That really rolls off the tongue. It's a bit of a cavern. It's 408, I believe, to dead center. Uh, the biggest ballpark that Ole Miss, for sure, has played in this year. And generally, the wind blows in. And so the storyline mm-hmm. in Omaha every year is not a lot of home runs, uh, hits that would have been home runs in almost every park stay in the yard here. Does that benefit Ole Miss, or does that hurt them uniquely to the other teams in this? Oh, that's a... I mean, on the, on the surface, let's think about the pitchers, right? I mean, when Dylan DeLucia gets hurt, it, it tends to be with the long ball. Was he giving up 14 home runs this season? That's a lot. Uh, of those 14 home runs, and I, I have no way of I'm, – I'm sure there's TrackMan data somewhere that could give us this answer. But I wonder how many of the 14 home runs that he has given up this season would have gone out of Charles Schwab Field. I don't know the answer to it, but my assumption is quite a few would not have left the yard. So a guy who gets some – some fly balls and a lot of fly ball outs, probably a good thing. Derek Diamond, I think, probably a good thing. Because he gives up some hard hit, hit balls and gives up some home runs. You know, Ole Miss hit a bunch of home runs in the last game against Miami, right? So against Arizona in game one of the Coral Gables Super Regional, Ole Miss hit a couple of home runs. Miami hit a couple of home runs. You had the low-scoring 2-1 to win over Miami, and then it was just like blast fest on that Monday in the regional final. Ole Miss hit one home run in two games against Southern Miss when it was 100 degrees, and the ball should have been carrying in a ballpark that gives up home runs. And that was T.J. McCant, and it was fairly inconsequential in the bottom of the eighth inning of game two when they were already leading 4 to nothing. Ole Miss has figured out a way to score runs kind of down the stretch. Their identity offensively has changed a little bit. It's not just hit the ball out of the ballpark. They've hit it in the gap some. They've hit the ball on the ground. They've moved runners around. They've been better with a runner on third and less than two outs. They've played some fundamental offensive baseball over the last few weeks. So, yeah, I think the ballpark probably to some degree plays to their advantage. But everybody's got to play in the same yard. Yeah. And by the way, people are like, well, no home runs. Yeah, there are more home runs that have been hit there in recent years. And by the way, the ball is so hot this year. Yeah, there's been that. I don't know if it's a conspiracy, air quotes or not, but a lot more home runs in regionals and super regionals this year. They are up. Yeah, but also in the regular season. I mean, teams just hit more home runs this year. I do wonder. Which I'm all for, by the way. It's exciting. Yeah. But somebody like Sonny D, like Auburn's most threatening bat. 22 long balls this year. Does that, I mean, because with all due respect to the young man, he's not legging out base hits and doubles, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, he's he's a long ball guy. So are you more inclined? He has a home run in six of Auburn's last eight games. I mean, just on fire. I mean, you would think... I was thinking about this, too. I didn't put it in our question list. But, you know, if you just walk him every time up. Because, again, with all due respect, having him on the base pass is not the worst thing for you. (laughs) And you'd rather not pitch to him, right? But does the bigger dimensions make you more likely to not give a free pass and pitch to him? Because it's just more difficult for him to hurt you in a bigger place. And I, I think it's completely situational. Like if he's leading off an inning, you just go ahead and put him on? Or Hey, Dad, did Renfro play in the College World Series? In yeah, Omaha? 13. Mm-hmm. He was on a tear that, uh, at that famous point, home run. He? Yeah. And did not get walked. There's that famous home run of him walking up the corner on the bases and saluting the crowd. No. Yeah. I mean, you, you have hitters that are that are great hitters and hit lots of home runs in the College World Series. I mean, Ivan Melendez 
Would you do that with him with Texas? Just don't pitch to him? I I think it's completely situational, right? I mean, it's got to be situational. Yeah. Yeah. In a scoreless game with the bases empty, if Sonny D comes to the plate, you're going to pitch to him. You're not worried about a solo home run. If you've got second and third or a runner on second with two outs and first base open and you've got a two run lead in the seventh inning, you're probably putting him on. Don't let that guy beat you. If the next guy beats me, so be it. I'm not letting the guy's got 22 bombs. I don't think you just avoid him, but I think you're careful with him. And you let the situation in the game dictate whether or not you put him on base or not. What else? All right. Um, So I asked about weaknesses earlier. Is there a strength that Ole Miss has that you think more of than anybody else in the field, or at least on their side of the bracket? Do they do something better than anybody else there? No. Nothing stands out. I mean, they're a good hitting team, but so is so are all of them. You worry about them, I, and, and I haven't seen them recently, but I remember Borky, early in the season, you were always on them defensively. If they've improved on that, great. If not, it's going to really hurt them. I bet played pretty well defensively in the postseason. Much greater. Right, they they yeah. had um, they had three errors in the regional championship game against Arizona, or maybe it was two. There were two on Jacob Gonzalez, and they were up like fourteen at the time. And then they had one error in two games against Southern Miss, and it was the the failed pickoff throw where Hunter Elliott kind of airmailed it over to first base, and it was a two base error. Now, they've been, I mean, Chatagnier's been really, really good at second base. Garrett Wood played well defensively at third. Um, Gonzalez made some really good plays. Elko made some really good, infield defense has been really good. And I think they feel a little bit better about the group they've got in the outfield than maybe they did at some points this year. You, do you think they're just going to stick with the, the changes that that Bianco made in in the outfield yeah. and at third base, I just I, I don't know what they're going to do with McCants. I don't know if they're going to stick with. I, my, I think this is what I would do, and I'm not even sure if I believe this is what Mike Bianco is going to do. I think maybe you 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 kind of stick with what's worked for you. Start Garrett Wood at third base. Start Justin Bench in center field. Start Calvin Harris in right field. And then when you get to the sixth inning. Make that defensive change. Put T.J. McCants out there and then see what he gives, gives you at the plate. I mean, the, the home run for McCants was such a great feel-good story. But he, he was hitting 140 from May 1st up through that home run on Sunday in Hattiesburg. Yeah, and Bianco made reference to it after the game. He's, he's just had a, a rough year away from baseball. And so seeing, yeah, him, I mean, seeing him get the hit in that moment was pretty cool knowing what he what he's been through 